Uh, we are here with John Akers, one of the gaming industry's legendary <laughs> uh, technologists and games uh, innovators. Uh, and John, it's always a pleasure to have you here. At these it's always sessions. a pleasure to be here. We've known each other for a long time now. And, and uh, if you look at our hair, either one of us, you'll see <laughs> what we mean by a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, let's start off a little bit with uh, a couple of the buzzword type issues, one of which has become to prominence very recently, cybersecurity. Yes. Any thoughts as to what the industry should do or should do better than it is to protect itself? Well, I, th I think in fairness, it's not a new revelation of cybersecurity. This has been brought to the public's attention again because of the recent attacks. And for, for ourselves, we took security very seriously when we started designing the system in 2017 with the idea of really emphasizing encryption, authentication, and authorization in everything we do and helping the casinos to manage social engineering. But that, that remains the big challenge is how do you manage, you're only as good as, as your, your most open person, as the one that is least following the rules. And, and we've seen that again. We also have the larger issue of do you pay a ransom or not? Which is better? You know, Caesars lost 30 million, MGM lost 110, but who are they gonna go after next time? The one that paid or the one that resisted? That's gonna be an interesting thing to see. But we, we've, we take uh, cybersecurity very seriously. We are class leading on our systems. Uh, everything is encrypted from the moment it leaves the slot machine. Uh, are there things the industry <clears throat> should be doing that it's not doing or should be doing better? To protect itself? I think that the industry has to focus on growth and we got to look at the cybersecurity very seriously but you're never going to achieve a hundred percent. If IT and nothing against the IT professionals if they had their way and they locked up everything so it was totally secure it would also be unusable and we're always walking a bridge between how do we go out and provide the service, the entertainment that the player is looking for at an affordable price that leaves a profit for us, and how do we provide reasonable protections? And we gotta be cautious about those reasonable protections. It's a balance. And that kind of brings me to my second buzzword question, which is artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, you, you can see a lot of things that can be done that are tools, you can see other things that can be done that maybe bring, uh, and, folks who would employ artificial intelligence maybe over an edge and reg regulators wouldn't like. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, there's, there's, that's a, a great question. It could take an hour to cover every aspect of it. But first of all, let's, let's look at AI, which is certainly in the news with all the things it could be. It's important to realize that those are true, it could be, but it's not. AI is not nearly as advanced at this moment in time as people pretend it is. It's a, it's a great tool, it's going to be incredibly powerful, but it's not there yet. It's, to me, it's a lot like the internet in the 1990s when everybody presumed it was here, and it actually had to go through a period of down and then back up, a period of disappointment and then reconstruction, and I think we'll see the same. We have to be, I like to focus on just the word intelligence. How do we please this customer, cause them to come back more often and bring their friends, and turn a profit while they're happy. How do we do that in ever larger numbers? And that requires intelligence. Some of the tools will be heuristic, traditional programming. Some of the tools will be learning-based, artificial intelligence. It's gonna be a combination of those. But at the end of the day, our goal doesn't change. The tools we use change, but the goals do not. I think that between the tech, well, with all the technologies we're developing, we have the opportunity to do an even better job than ever of engaging players. But we also have the opportunity to overcome a huge threat to this industry, and that is that our industry, casino gambling, does not know how to create a new customer. We don't know how to reach out to uh, a non-gambler and ask them to become a gambler. We, we leave threats in place. Oh, if you become a gambler, you'll be addicted. If you become a gambler, you're stupid in the eyes of your friends. We have to address those things. Those, and artificial intelligence will help, but we can't mistake the goal with the technique. Okay. Well, that's a different perspective. <laughs> uh, 
John, tell us about Acres Technologies. Where, where are you guys? We're doing great. We, we've got great partners in the industry. Uh, every installation we've done has been a real success technically and operationally. And we've only just begun. We're building, we called our first product foundation for a reason. Everything gets built on top of it. We now have the absolute best set of real-time rich data that helps us understand what a player is going through at the moment. Because we've, we've learned that we can, we not only have to understand a, a, a basic personality, we have to understand where you are in the stresses of your experience tonight. Have you been losing a lot? Is it three days before your next payday? What do we have to do to make you feel comfortable? And more than that, in, in today's world, we also owe our players the, the burden of tracking how much they're spending and helping them to stay within their affordable limits. True growth in gambling will come from encouraging customers to disengage for the evening at certain points in order that they can stay within their affordable budget. That's the key to our next generation of growth. Sounds to me like that's also where artificial intelligence plays a role. It promises to play a role. The challenge that we face right now is you go to use it and it, it, you can see examples, whoa, this could be great, but you see giant flaws in it. You, know, you, you saw the story about the court case a few months ago where an attorney used artificial intelligence to, to do a court filing and it, it cited cases it made up. We have to be very careful that we don't jump onto a tool before it's truly mature. Um, okay, let's uh, talk a little bit here about uh, some specifics at uh, Acres. You have been in the forefront of introducing cashless. And cashless to some folks is coming along a little more evolutionary than revolutionary. Uh, tell us a little bit about your products and how they differenti dif differentiate and also how you see cashless evolving now. Sure, we, we built our system originally to collect data and provide automated rewards to players. When COVID came along and made uh, regulators uh, open to the idea of allowing cashless in order to provide, to prevent the touch, right? They, they overcame a hurdle of, we don't ever want to allow a bank account to be coupled to a gaming machine for fear of the problem of gambling. Well, those, answer, those problems are handled better elsewhere. Uh, so when we take our product out, and we had a wonderful relationship, have a wonderful relationship with Penn Entertainment, they've deployed cashless in uh, well over a dozen properties. They're very, very happy with it. But they also made the decision to change their data gathering from their old systems to ours. That's where a lot of the cashless things are being hung up on. It triggers additional work beneath the surface that has to be done, and that, that causes pause as people start to reevaluate. And one of the interesting things that we've seen is a lot of casinos haven't really set a hard course for where they want their future to be. We're reactive instead of proactive. And unfortunately, here in Nevada, uh, even though our, our headlines say record revenues, if we adjust those record revenues for inflation, 20 2022, which was by the newspaper's declaration, the best earning year in gaming, was actually 20% below 2007. We've lost 20% of our business in, in that time, and that's 15, 16 years. That's the problem, because we don't know how to invite a customer. So when we start the conversation about cashless, it's not simply about the convenience for the player, although that's a part of it. It's also because most people are coming in with less and less cash in their pocket. They gotta go to the ATM machine, they gotta have all those frictional points. But also, if we don't go to cashless, we can't measure your spend accurately, and therefore we can't provide the problem gambling protections that we can otherwise. Cashless is the gateway to an entirely new future. It's used on the internet by everyone, it's loved. No one could ever imagine, oh, I'm going to buy something from Amazon, I'm going to write them a check and mail it to them. That, that's not going to happen. We do cash this in all the rest of our world, but getting it into the insular world of gambling has proven to be more difficult, partly because it requires a lot of other thinking to go with it. But it, will, it is and will be the future. Uh, now, uh, your company is privately held, yes. but you intend to go public. 
Uh, that's been for a while now. Yes. And the capital markets have not been um, uh, very active in terms of IPOs and M&A the last couple of years, but supposedly, from what uh, we understand, that's starting to loosen up. Uh, what are the prospects for your IPO? Well, the prospects are still there. Our goal has always been to, number one, raise capital uh, to develop the products the industry needs in the future. Number two, to be able to attract the best minds in the industry and give them a reward. If you're not public and you give them stock, it's hard for them to, to say, oh, look, my work is, is benefiting me. And then number three, there are some regulatory benefits to being uh, a publicly traded company. Uh, the threshold for investor uh, investigations or licensing is, is much higher in a, in a lot of private companies here in Nevada, for example. If you own a single share in a private company, you've you got to be licensed where you've got to own at least 5% of a public company before you'd be required to be licensed. So we've looked at those and we, we want to look at the public market as soon as it becomes available. We're prepared for that. But we're also prepared for if it's not. We've, because of the accomplishments our products have made in the past year, year and a half, uh, we find it much easier to attract private investment than what we used to be uh, on, on a large scale. And we also see opportunity to create a privately traded market so that we can provide those opportunities to, to make a down payment on a house to the employee that's worked here for five years or so and that has you know, he, came, he or she came to work to benefit their family, not just to watch a stock accumulate. So we want to provide that exit path and we're open to being public or whatever alternative private method we can have. We look at SpaceX, for example, and, and see how they've remained private for a very long time and they've created those secondary markets through which their employees can, can cash out or at least cash out a part of their holdings. Okay, so when we spoke a year ago, mm -hmm. the assumption was you're going public. Yes. And what you're saying now is that's still the intention, but you might remain private. We will do whatever provides our shareholders the highest long-term value. By long-term, I don't mean 30 years, but if we can provide a greater value at the end of 2024 by doing something different than we did, than we otherwise have done at the beginning of 2024, we'll do that. But we do also hear every investor every employee that says, I really need a chance to liquidate some of my holdings. So whether we go public or not, we will create that avenue. We're, uh, we're going to beef up our staff. We're going to make a, we're, we're, we're going to uh, do a lot more to appeal to in the investor community. Uh, we've been talking to a few close friends and, and people that are highly interested in the industry to now we want to more generalize. We'll be improving our CFO position, all of our uh, uh, financial communication, whether we go public or not. Okay, great. Uh, you have a booth this year at G2E. Yes. What are one or two of the products that people absolutely must see at your booth? I think that the idea of Tebow is really important. Ticket in, bonusing out. And that is that we take the traditional printer that's on the slot machine and use it for bonusing purposes. Now bonuses could be, uh, Sarah just won $1,200 on machine 1482 at Caesars Palace on March 11th, 2023, whatever it is. Bonusing can be simply an acknowledgement of accomplishment. It could be a tip ticket that you can give to your waitress and have uh, that recognition because more and more people don't have dollar bills in their pocket anymore. And it, it can also provide opportunities to invite friends. We can give a ticket and say, if you give this ticket to a friend and they get a card and they start playing, they will get this and you will get that. So it's a, it's a piece of currency that has greater emotional engagement sometimes than electronic currencies do. Okay, great. Uh, cover a lot of ground. Anything else you'd like folks to know about Acres Technology? We're here to help the industry grow. Our commitment is to the land-based casino industry. We're developing tools and products that use those tools to help casinos significantly increase their revenue and their profits. That's what we're about. Very interesting and informative. Thank you, Thank you. John. Appreciate it.